Hello, welcome back to Simon's Rants. I'm Simon, and today we're going to be ranking every Treasure Island adaptation ever. Real quick before I start the video, please take a moment to subscribe. I know that I don't normally do this, I don't ask people to subscribe that often, but the statistics show that it actually does help. So if you're new here and you haven't yet, or if you've just been hanging around and you like what you see but haven't taken the time to do it yet, please take a moment to subscribe because it does help me out a lot. And also, if you want to make a more immediate impact, please go to shop.spreadshirt.com slash Simon's Rants. That's where I put my merch. I've put a lot of work into it and there's a bunch of different designs to choose from. There's also a bunch of different items to choose from like t-shirts, hoodies, sweaters, cups, mugs, water bottles, backpacks, all kinds of stuff. And I'm not just saying this because it's my merch. It's really high quality material. It's really comfortable. The hoodies that I've worn in different videos are some of the most comfortable hoodies and just pieces of clothing period that I've ever worn. I really like them. And it's also helping out me. So if you like my content and want me to keep creating, then please consider helping. Thanks. But anyway, let's get back to the video. So a while back, I made a different video called Every A Christmas Carol Adaptation Ever. And in that video, I went through most adaptations where I talked about some of the worst and some of the best and some in the middle. But I did end up leaving out a couple of them, like the Barbie one, the Smurfs one, and the Mr. Magoo one, because I didn't think that they were that important, but apparently they were. So for this video, I went out of my way to get every adaptation I could possibly get my hands on and put into this video. But I couldn't include literally every version because there's quite a few that have been lost forever from the silent era. There was one from Germany that I just couldn't get, another one from Russia I couldn't get, and I also decided to not include TV shows because it's just an unfair comparison. There's just too many differences that I didn't want to include that and muddle the process. So sorry if you were hoping to find Wishbone's version on here, it's not going to be on here. Also if you go on Wikipedia you'll see a few more listed that I didn't consider actual adaptations. They're movies that took elements and barred moments, but they weren't actually adaptations of Treasure Island, in my mind at least. So also sorry to the Page Master, because even though their adaptation of Treasure Island is honestly better than half of the ones on this list, it's just a couple of scenes in a bigger movie that wasn't about Treasure Island. Look to the map. What's it say? It's, uh, in the middle, by the waterfall. No, it's east. Buy some broccoli. Give me that. Broccoli? We are half wits. It's west by a tree. Go. And lastly, I want to say that there's a lot of great adaptations, but there's no single one perfect adaptation. All of them do different things better or worse than others. So just because I consider one better than the other doesn't mean that you won't like it for different reasons and maybe rank them differently. Because this is all honestly subjective in the end. I have my opinions as a critic, but you're not going to agree with everything that I say. So why don't you leave your favorite in the comments below along with why not the rest of the list. But that's enough for me. Let's finally get on with this list. Coming in last at 19th is Pirates of Treasure Island. This is the single lowest rated adaptation on IMDb and it's for a good reason. This movie is utter shit. It almost looks like a bad student film or something that a YouTuber would have made like 10 years ago. The costumes are bad, the writing is terrible, the acting is laughable, and the sound is barely audible. You may not be able to see my pistol cue, but I know you can damn sure smell it. Sorry, sir. I thought it was a rock. Ha! Rock collector, are you? You get... Shut your dog. Time to pay the piper. I'll have your head for this disobedient silver. It starts absolutely awful, but hey, it does get a little bit better when the big CGI monster attacks. You know, the giant monster from Treasure Island, you remember that part, right? It just, it looks like a sci-fi channel movie. It's awful, and who thought that was a good idea? It's, what? Why? Why did you do that? Why did you try to do that? This honestly has to be in my mind like a sci-fi channel movie, like a Sharknado, like a Lava Lantula, like one of those movies that are intentionally made bad in order to be funny. That's, that's all I can assume that happened here. I cannot believe that this was someone's genuine attempt to make a good movie. That's not possible. It's, it's just not. But honestly, it doesn't even succeed at being a so bad it's good movie. It's just, 
It's just bad, and not in a funny way. It fails at that. <sighs> wow. Number 18. Animal Treasure Island. Interesting design ideas are ruined by cheap looking animation with awful cliche anime style dialogue. The plot is so dissimilar to that of Treasure Island that I don't believe the writers ever read or watched anything to do with Treasure Island before. It appears that they learned the plot through a particularly bad game of telephone. I just, I, I don't even know where to begin with this. First of all, Billy Bones shows up at the inn where Jim Hawkins and his pet sidekick talking mouse and his younger brother are. Uh. And Billy Bones is missing a leg. So you're like, okay, how does that tie into the whole watch out for the sailor with the one leg thing? Because if he's only got one leg, that's kind of redundant. Oh, but then no worries about that because John Silver has both of his legs later. Oh, also Jim Hawkins, after discovering the map, then sets out to find the treasure on his own. Well, with his mouse companion and younger brother, but no Small, he doesn't exist. No Trelawney, he doesn't exist. No Livesey, he doesn't exist. It's just, just them in a little boat and then they get attacked by the pirates and get kidnapped and have to work for them but they don't know that the map's there they're not heading toward treasure island it's not the plot i don't know what it is but it's just it's just not treasure island frankly i don't know what it is but it's not treasure island and it's it's not good number 17 peg leg musket and saber also known as scalawag which is a much better name i think i they should have stuck with that this version is notable for the distinction of taking place in the wild west rather than out at sea and thereby replacing pirates with cowboys this film is also notable for being kirk douglas's debut as director but rather than being a revelation is much more of a letdown the movie is cheaply made and it shows poor camera work and quality lackluster action sequences and an overall dull appearance prevent this interesting idea to pan out in the least Needless additions to the plot and character list is subtraction by addition as it just seems to waste time and cause the film to lose focus on the actual point and plot of the film. And it is a shame because Kirk Douglas does put in a decent attempt at being Silver, or Peg in this because they change his name for some reason, but it's just not enough. I understand the appeal of trying to change the scenery and setting and genre even, but you didn't do enough with it and everything you did was just so low quality that... Yeah, I just didn't care. Also, Jim Hawkins has a British accent, despite this taking place in the Wild West. So, you know, there's that too. Number 16, Treasure Island, 1985. This is another adaptation that takes liberties with time and place and frankly events that happen in this story. But instead of it being in the Wild West or back at sea like the original material, it's the 1980s somewhere. Having a modern day take on the classic story is both risky and intriguing on paper, but this adaptation manages to lose any personality that the source material contained whatsoever. Instead of having a great adventure story, we have an artsy foreign film that only resembles Treasure Island vaguely in passing. And once you start to think you finally know where it's going, you don't. It is such a bizarre story and movie. And honestly, there may be a stroke of artistic genius hidden away in there somewhere in the back, but as far as a Treasure Island adaptation goes, this is the last thing that I want. If I'm trying to watch Treasure Island, I'm not going to watch this. Why would I? Why would anyone? It's just, it's not Treasure Island. It's, yeah, I, I think taking the name was a mistake. You should have just tried to come up with your own thing. Maybe even say inspired by Treasure Island to avoid being sued, but just don't call it Treasure Island. It's not. Number 15. Treasure Island, 1999. This film is low budget and feels like it throughout, but it doesn't prevent it from feeling like one of the better adaptations, especially with Jack Palance delivering a great final performance in a theatrical film as Long John Silver. However, what does make this film not feel like one of the better adaptations is its absolute disregard of the source material. Changes here or there are expected in any adaptation. It's just part of the adapting process. It's going to happen. And that's okay. Sometimes changes are a good thing. Sometimes you're adding something that makes the story better better or taking out something that made the story worse. There's plenty of adaptations like Jurassic Park that change almost everything but end up being an equally good movie to the book. The key to that is changing things that are in line and to the heart of the original source material and the idea behind it. But if you go out of your way to change the characters in such a way that feels like a literal betrayal of everything you knew about this story, then yeah, that's that's not okay. I don't really want to get into too many spoilers on this list, but 
yeah, the ending was kind of sacrilegious. And it's a shame, because Jack Palance delivered one of the best Long John Silvers out of any of them. I'm not saying he was the best, but he was probably top five. And like I said, this was the last movie that he did that was released in theaters. So it's kind of a sad swan song to see him acting his best in this role that obviously meant a lot to him, only for it to be betrayed by the rest of the film. Which is, uh, frankly, unwatchable. It's He's, he's good. That's about it. <laughs> Number 14. Treasure Island, 1996. If Fisher-Price were to make a Treasure Island adaptation, this would be it. It's very possible to make a kid's movie or aim an adaptation at a younger audience and still have a good film, but this isn't that. Blind Pew isn't actually blind, he just has to wear these giant glasses. Smollett is small, and animals sing. It's not an awful version if you're a toddler but if you're anything other than a toddler, you won't want to see it. And if you are a toddler or have a toddler you want to show Treasure Island to, why would you watch this one when there are so many other better versions, even great versions, that are acceptable for all ages? This version ultimately just feels kind of pointless. Like, nobody wants or needs it. It's, it's not good. <laughs> the next four numbers, 13 through 10, are interchangeable. They're all not bad, but they're all extremely boring, so I will talk about each individually, but you can rank them however you want in the middle here. They're all just meh. Number 13 is Treasure Island 1987. It doesn't have any real personality or character to it, and never gives you any real reason to want to keep watching it. To its credit, it does try to be true to the source material and include as many moments and characters as possible, but with a runtime of only 50 minutes, it feels more like a Cliff Notes version than an actual genuine adaptation, and glosses over every moment with seeming indifference. It makes you almost wonder why the this version got made because it doesn't feel like anybody involved with it cared at all. Maybe they did, but it didn't show. Number 12. Movie Tunes Treasure Island. This version looks and feels more like a PBS TV show or an educational home video than an actual movie. It tries surprisingly hard to be accurate to the original source material and does pretty well at it, but it doesn't have any personality to it whatsoever. Especially Long John Silver. He's the most important character in the whole thing and you just, you made him boring. Frankly, you made the whole thing forgettable. I just watched it a couple days ago and I don't remember it at all. Number 11. Treasure Island, 1971. It's honestly hard to keep coming up with things to say about these last few because, like I said, they're all basically the same and have the same basic flaw. They're boring. There's nothing really that wrong with this one, but there's nothing about it that makes it stand out or be memorable in any way. It's only 45 minutes long, so you'd think that it was intended for kids, but it's so bleak and bland that I don't think any kids would find it entertaining. Now, I know I've said it before, and I still agree with it now, that the best kids' movies are the ones that challenge kids to think about more complicated plots and characters and things like that, and this is a little more complex, but it's just too bland. Like, I don't think an adult would be interested in it either, so I'm not saying that it's too adult for kids, it's just too boring for anybody. <laughs> Number 10, Treasure Island, 1973. This particular adaptation feels more like an older Scooby-Doo episode or maybe something else by Hanna-Barbera than it actually feels like a Treasure Island movie. It goes in a very different direction than the last few of being very restrained and kind of boring and goes as all out as possible to be kiddy and over the top, which does lead to some entertaining moments, but frankly, the most entertaining thing about it is that Davy Jones from the Monkees plays Jim Hawkins. How are you called, lad? Jim Hawkins, sir. Well, Jim Hawkins. Here's a penny for ye. And there's another penny every day if you keep a weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg. One leg, sir? Soon as you see him coming, run faster in a typhoon and let me know. Y yeah, yes, sir. It is one of the more entertaining kid versions, but it kind of feels insulting to kids expecting them not to be able to handle the source material of Treasure Island without animal characters and song numbers and a trio of German pirates named Eins, Zwei, and Drei and a pirate with a literal harmonica stuck halfway down his throat so every time he talks, you hear the harmonica play. It's like... What? <laughs> In the end, it is pretty stupid, but the song numbers aren't bad, and the jokes work most of the time, so it's not bad for a kid's one. When we find him, we'll fix his bones. Tie him up in rocks and stones. You lie on the bottom of Davy Jones. When we find that boy, keep looking, keep looking, find that boy. Keep looking, keep looking, find that boy. Keep looking, keep looking, find that boy. Number nine, Treasure Island. 
2012. This more recent version had some good ideas, but ultimately was just trying too hard to be different from all the others and be edgy. The movie has endless quick zooms, fast forwarding, and shaky cam, and it's enough to make you sick. I'm all for creative filmmaking and editing, but honestly this just felt like they were trying to compensate for something. Just like trying to make it edgy, the camera work and editing felt like they were trying too hard. The casting is also creative, but sadly misguided in my opinion. When I first heard that Eddie Izzard was playing Long John Silver in this adaptation, I didn't know how to take it. I just, it didn't comprehend, it didn't make sense in my mind. Like, why would you go that way? But I decided to give him a fair chance and I watched it and no, he wasn't awful. He wasn't as bad as I thought he might be, but he also wasn't good. And that's how I felt about most of this cast. Don't get me wrong, not the entire cast was bad. Toby Regbo is perfectly respectable as Jim Hawkins and Donald Sutherland was fine as Flynn as well. I think he could have been great as opposed to just fine, but he didn't seem to really care that much. But anyway, you have Elijah Wood who I love as an actor, I, and as far as I know, he seems like a great guy too, but Elijah Wood plays Ben Gunn, and it goes just about exactly how you would expect it to. It's just a complete miscast. And that's where it just feels like this whole movie is just trying too hard to be different and outthink everybody else and be the odd one that's just weird and cool, but it doesn't really work. On top of weird casting decisions, there's also weird writing decisions where there's needless additions, unnecessary changes, and characters just don't act like themselves half the time. It's not overall a bad movie. There's definitely more good in it than bad in it, but not a lot. Number 8. Ken Russell's Treasure Island. How does one describe Ken Russell's Treasure Island? Well, part of me wants to compare it to a Mel Brooks take on the subject material, and part of me wants to say that Treasure Island and Rocky Horror Picture Show had a baby. Blind Pew is a bedazzled tap dancer, Dr. Livesey and Squire Trelawney are drag queens, and Long John Silver is actually Long Jane Silver, who's doing her best Marilyn Monroe impression. I'd have you hung, drawn, and quartered on the spot. If it wasn't my birthday. Happy birthday. To you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. Magistrate. So take that however you will. Or not, maybe you're into that kind of thing, or, or maybe you're not. <laughs> it is an extremely strange spoof parody thing that is, if you like this kind of stuff, hilarious. I found it hilarious, but I'm sure equally as many people won't find it funny at all. And I know it's not really a true adaptation of the source material, it is a comedy based on it, it's a parody of it. And that's why I couldn't rank it any higher, but honestly, like I said, I thought it was really good. Don't hold it against me if you don't, it's obviously a niche thing, it's obviously for a very select kind of audience, but for those of you who like it, you'll love it. Number 7. Treasure Island 1988. This is a somewhat absurdist Russian version intended for children, but has enough humor, charm, and fascinating animation to make it enjoyable for all ages. The animation especially is mesmerizing and you only wish it was used for something a little less silly than this. To add to the absurdity, the film is often interrupted with live action interludes and musical numbers that help to keep this from graduating from a good kids movie to just a good movie period. <laughs> This movie is very weird, very, very weird, but that's also kind of why I love it. Like I said, it's absurdism and Russian absurdism, which I had never had any exposure to before. It's so weird and so crazy that it kind of makes you wonder, is all Russian television like this? But it's hilarious. The fact that I haven't seen anything like it before is also a plus in that it's so memorable. It's so strange and will forever be etched into my mind. And I'm not mad about it. It's, it's funny. It's good. If you haven't seen it yet, which you probably haven't, unless you're from Russia, go ahead and check it out. It's, it's definitely memorable. Now, we truly get into the best ones. You may like some of the other ones, but I don't think you can qualify any of them as particularly great versions. But now we're in the top six, and any one of these, like I said, it is subjective, so if any one of these is your favorite, I understand why. They're each great and unique and better at different things in their own way. They each have their own best moments. So let's just get into the top six. Number six is 
Treasure Island 1934. This adaptation is directed by Victor Fleming and I honestly cannot point to any major flaw in it. The only things that kept me from putting it higher on the list are honestly subjective things that some people may not care about at all, but I just didn't think it was quite as good as the rest. The best part of the film is easily Wallace Beery's performance as Long John Silver. It set the precedent for decades. So many people tried to mimic and create a performance like his. But even as great as his performance was, it was marred slightly in my mind by the overly kiddie take on the story where every lie he tells is followed by a wink and a nod toward the camera. And I know that's not a flaw necessarily, but I just prefer it when the audience doesn't quite know right away and are left in just a little bit of suspense. This version is also notable for having Jackie Cooper as Jim Hawkins. And honestly, I don't like him at all in this. Now the character of Jim Hawkins is generally boring. He's flat, he doesn't have much of a personality. He's there to be the main character and not much else. So in most versions, I don't really care about him. In some adaptations, he's made into a good character by a good actor, but most of the time, he's neither here nor there, he's just the main character placeholder. In this version in particular, he's actually bad. He actually takes away from the story in my mind. Cooper has such an aw shucks delivery that it makes every line sound like he's saying, gee willikers. But bless my soul, sir. He certainly came to sing. I don't want my main character in an adventure story reminding me of Betty Boop. It's just not cool. It's not a good look. Maybe it's due to the character being played by too young of an actor, but seeing him bawl his eyes out like a baby when he finds out that Long John Silver is actually the bad guy was just cringy to me. I know. Well, we were mates and we were going to run goats together. I even asked him to live with me. He was the best friend I knew. He gave me... I never knew anybody like him before. But I know him now. Huh. Certain I do. But those are my only two gripes with this movie. Everything else about this adaptation is great, honestly. So if you want an adaptation that's for younger audiences, then maybe this is the way you go. I'm not saying that it's Baby's First Treasure Island because I think adults will enjoy it too. I'm just saying that it isn't the most mature take on the subject material. That doesn't mean it's bad though. Like I said, it's still good, it's still number six, and I still enjoy it a lot. Number five, Treasure Island, 1972. Having Orson Welles as Long John Silver on paper sounds absolutely amazing, and it definitely could have been, but in reality, he ended up being both the best and worst thing about this adaptation. Welles took on the role of Silver after being under contract in the 60s to both star in and direct his own Treasure Island film. After plans and funding fell through, he remained under contract and was forced into the 1972 adaptation under the direction of John Hugh, who he didn't respect at all. He showed up drunk every day, reportedly off of two bottles of wine each morning at breakfast, and tried to direct the scenes despite not being the director. He slurs and mumbles his way through his entire performance, but still ends up delivering one of the best Long John Silver performances ever. Well, barbecue? One thing I claim. I claim Trelawney, and I'll wring his fat cow's head off his body. And the others? Them that dies will be the lucky ones. It's honestly fascinating to watch. If you haven't seen it yet, you should check it out. Just make sure you get the right version because there is a different version where he's dubbed over. Because like I said, he's kind of hard to understand. So if you can't get the version with him talking with subtitles, then the other version's easier to understand, but it's not Orson Welles. So it's not really the same. Honestly, the biggest flaw with this movie, the biggest crime that this adaptation committed, wasn't that it was bad. It's still number five on my list here, but it could have been number one. It could have been great, and that's a shame. Shiles off when we get the treasure and we leave them gentlemen ashore to starve slow like that'd be Captain England's way. Huh? I cut them down like so much bark. Friends way that'd be. Or Billy Bones. Billy was the man for that. Dead men don't bite. Number four, Disney's Treasure Island, 
1950. Despite feeling awfully Disney and squeaky clean at times, it remains one of the best adaptations of all time, due almost entirely to the groundbreaking performance by Robert Newton as Long John Silver. Newton single-handedly crafted the stereotypical pirate voice and mannerisms we still use till this day. If you talk like a pirate on Talk Like a Pirate Day, or if you saw Barbosa in Pirates of the Caribbean, you know what voice I'm talking about. That's from him. Heavy ball and a light charge of powder works best on a touchy little craft like this here. Eh. Try the balance. See the engraving on the trigger guard. Solid silver. We haven't always talked like that when talking like pirates. The reason we talk like that is because of him. He was groundbreaking, he was revolutionary, and that's great. The whole cast is able to hold their own against his stellar performance as well, and with excellent writing and character development, especially that of Silver, this is easily one of the best versions ever. Number 3. Muppet Treasure Island Despite being a kid version, including puppets and song numbers, this is surprisingly one of the most accurate and in-depth adaptations. Tim Curry's take on Long John Silver is also fantastic as he ranks among the best to ever do it. His flamboyant and lovable take on the character both fits the customary atmosphere created in all great Muppet films and carries the Jim-Silver relationship practically single-handedly. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. I got a terrible fear of hanging. We're shipmates, aren't we, Jim? Gentlemen of fortune, together. Give us one more chance. Oh, hell, Jim. I can never harm you. You're honest and brave and true. You didn't learn that from me. There aren't many flaws at all in this particular adaptation, and the Muppets fill whatever holes remain with amazing comedy and charisma. Hey, 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 Polly. What? What was that song that just happened? What are you talking about? You know, uh, Cabin Fever. <sighs> That. I know Muppet movies are intended for kids, they're family films, but they are genuinely hilarious for every age, and if you say that you don't like them or that you're too old for them, you're just lying. Dead Tom's dead! <coughs> Long John shot him! Oh, but, but Dead Tom's always been dead. That's why he's called Dead Tom. Oh. This movie is hilarious, and like I said, it's surprisingly accurate to the book. I'm not trying to say that it's the most accurate adaptation ever. I'm not. It definitely takes some liberties with it. I mean, there's talking puppets and Benjamin a gun and stuff like that, but everything they change is to make it more funny, to make it more interesting, and it definitely is hilarious. It's a great movie. There's not one moment in this entire movie that's not enjoyable. Number two. Treasure Planet. Treasure Planet is absolutely the most underrated adaptation of them all. I think mainly due to the change of scenery and era, which honestly never bothered me. It has the absolute best Long John Silver as portrayed by Brian Murray, and this version adds depth and charisma that no other version even tries to do. No, look, don't you get it? I screwed up. I mean, for two seconds, I thought that maybe I could do something right, but ah, I just... Forget it. Forget it. No, you listen to me, James Hawkins. You got the makings of greatness in you, but you gotta take the helm and chart your own course. Stick to it, no matter the squalls. And when the time comes, you get the chance to really test the cut of your sails and show what you're made of. Well, I hope I'm there, catching some of the light coming off you that day. The story is a bit abbreviated and some characters are cut out, but none of it's missed that much because they use that extra time for world building and showing off what this new galaxy is like with great character design and absolutely groundbreaking animation. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is actually also great as Jim Hawkins in this. I don't normally like Jim Hawkins, I already said that. The character is normally bland and boring and there's not much to it. And even though this version of the character takes some obvious inspiration from Anakin Skywalker, he still has the most personality and in-depth story arc of any version 
ever. He also possibly has the best personal theme of any character in any movie ever. Jim's theme, also known as I'm Still Here by John Resnick of the Goo Goo Dolls, is just a fantastic song even when detached from the movie. I can listen to it on repeat in my car and scream along for hours. <laughs> but it's especially great how it's used in the movie to demonstrate Jim's character arc as he's abandoned by his father and finds a new father figure in Long John Silver. They can't tell me who to be Cause I'm not what they see Yeah, the world is still sleeping while I keep on dreaming for me Despite this being just an animated Disney version, it has the best Long John Silver in any adaptation and the best Jim Hawkins in any adaptation. It also has the best character and chemistry and relationship development between the two out of all of them. It spends a lot of time on that because it knows that it matters. Every adaptation, but especially this one, hinges on that relationship and that development. And Treasure Planet honestly does it better than anybody else does. What say you ship out with us, lads? You and me, Hawkins and Silver. Full of ourselves and no ties to anyone! You know, when I got on this boat, I would have taken you up on that offer in a second. But, uh, I met this old cyborg, and he taught me that I could chart my own course. That's what I'm gonna do. And what do you see? Off that bow of yours. A future. <laughs> Look at you. Glowing like a solar fire. You're something special, Jim. You're gonna rattle the stars you are. Honestly, I came really close to ranking this number one. I really wanted to. It's my personal favorite version, but I couldn't in clean conscience rank it the best adaptation because it's not the most accurate representation of the source material. So what I have as the best adaptation of Treasure Island ever is number one, Treasure Island 1990. To me, this is the quintessential Treasure Island adaptation. There may be other versions that have better individual moments, castings, or things in them, but if you want the best overall and easily the most faithful adaptation, then this is the one for you. First of all, you have the best overall cast. Easily. You've got Charlton Heston as Long John Silver, and although I said Brian Murray was my favorite of all time, Charlton Heston is still in my top three or four. You've got a young Christian Bale as Jim Hawkins, who's easily my second favorite Jim Hawkins. You've got Christopher Lee as Brian Pugh, which is just awesome. And you've got one of the best character actors of all time in Peter Postlethwaite as George Mary. And those are just a few of the big names. Everybody else in this movie is perfectly casted as well. This has easily, like I said, easily the best casting out of all of them. And it's not even really close. I give you one, George. One more word of your sauce, and I'll eat your liver for breakfast. Now I resign by thunder. Elect who you want for captain. I'm done with it. No, John. Your captain here. Forever kill for captain. Forever kill for captain. For 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 well, George. Looks like you'll have to wait another turn. This, uh, black spot, it ain't good for much now, is it? Dick's crossed his luck and spoiled his Bible, that's about all. Here, Jim. Like I said at the beginning, there is no perfect adaptation, and this isn't the exception to that rule. There's mediocre action sequences and uninspired direction from Charlton Heston's son, Frazier, but the overall quality and the previously mentioned outstanding cast more than makes up for any flaw. Some versions may be flashier or more fun or have one or two things in them that are better than in this version, but if you take everything into account all around, top to bottom, this is definitively the best adaptation of all time. At least in my opinion. <laughs> So there you have it. That was my list. That was every Treasure Island adaptation ranked from worst to best. 
at least the ones that I could get. <laughs> but like I said, this list is subjective. It's just my opinion. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below what your favorite was and why. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and if you're new here, subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye. No, it's East. Buy some broccoli.